take a weight on the end of a length of string or cord, like here I have some keys at the end of a chain, and start it rotating. Here we have it moving in a circle, and then suddenly shorten the length, and you'll see it speed up. That also demonstrates this principle of orbital mechanics. And back to you, Walter. Jack Siegel, I'm going to get you a job at the high school uh, teaching uh, orbital physics. That was an excellent demonstration. Thanks a lot. We're getting a picture now from the USS Wasp. It's about 1,000 miles out in the Atlantic now, downrange from Cape Kennedy here, uh, with this picture live being transmitted by satellite back to us here. Bill Ryan's aboard the Wasp. Now on her launch aboard station, 1,120 miles east of Cape Kennedy. 525 miles southeast of Bermuda. And with the Wasp is her plane guard destroyer, the USS Wilson, which will stay with this prime recovery ship throughout the flight and recovery of Gemini 9. Two other destroyers are on station in the Western Atlantic this launch day, the Bordelon and the McCaffrey. The McCaffrey, 275 miles east of the Cape. The Bordelon, 705 miles east of the Cape. If all goes well and Gemini 9 achieves orbit, that will be the signal for these two mm. ships to head for their home ports. It will also be the signal for the skipper of the Wasp, Captain Gordon Hartley, to start moving his prime recovery ship to the west in gradual steps to provide recovery facilities on Thursday and Friday should Gemini 9 fly less than her scheduled three days. By Saturday morning, we should be on station 425 miles east of Cape Kennedy, waiting to make a recovery after Gemini 9 has completed 44 revolutions. Weather in the Wasp's area today is less than ideal. It's hazy, some clouds range up to 14,000 feet, and four-foot trees are running. But these conditions would not make recovery difficult, and most of Wasp's first to recovery aircraft are already airborne. Story here is Don Blair on the flight deck. What you see here behind and around me in various stages of flight preparation are the WASP's contingency aircraft. The past experience has shown how nice it is to have these ships in the air if and when something goes wrong with the prime flight team, which is already in the air and on the job. The WASP has enough aircraft in reserve to duplicate its recovery force twice if necessary. But the real, real activity here on Recovery Day will be when the astronauts are brought on board. And if they do leave the spacecraft and come in by helicopter, then we'll be seeing them right here on the flight deck where we are now with the helicopter setting down just forward of my present position. It'll be helo number 61 if it's the prime recovery ship. Now, if they stay with the spacecraft, which happens to be the wish of command pilot Tom Stafford, We'll see them down on the hangar deck level with elevator three lowered to receive the spacecraft down in that position. So the last is set from the to stern. We sure hope the big show doesn't come before Saturday morning. This is Don Clare on the flight deck of the walk. And it's T minus five minutes in the count, T minus eight minutes to the actual launch, given a three minute hold. CBS News color coverage of Gemini 9 will continue in a moment. Semester. Gale winds, driving rain, blazing sun. Severe weather that demands the most from house paint. That's why so many homeowners here and everywhere give their homes the extra protection of Sherwin-Williams house paint. Unlike so-called bargain paints that often blister and peel in a year or two, Sherwin-Williams protects up to three years longer. Doesn't it make sense to give your home this longer-lasting protection too? You'll paint less often, and of course that means you save money with Sherwin-Williams house paint. Look for this Cover the Earth trademark. It tells you you're getting the highest quality in paint for home and industry. Sherwin-Williams paints. Back here at our CBS uh, News Space Center at Cape Kennedy. The count is T minus four minutes. Uh, which actually means seven minutes till the launch. The launch is due to come of Gemini 9 at 38 minutes and 20 seconds after, uh, after 11 o'clock uh, Eastern Standard Time. 
and that is some six minutes and 48 seconds from now. Stafford and Cernan in their spacecraft. There may be uh, some problem with the spacecraft. They test the ohms, that is the attitude maneuvering system uh, of the uh, spacecraft, the little tiny rockets which do that job uh, just before launch. They made one test of it, and now they have ordered a second test, which is unusual and might indicate that they had some small problem with those Ohm's thrusters. However, we have no confirmation of that. We do expect to hear very shortly uh, some more about it, however. It's T minus uh, 6 minutes and 13, 12 seconds to the launch with a three-minute uh, hold included in that figure as we wait for the target vehicle to come back over the Cape. And now here's Jack King. We're coming up on three minutes. Mark, three minutes and holding. T-minus, three minutes and holding. We are in the plan built-in hold that will help us coincide our launch with the orbit of the augmented target docking Agena, which is now coming over the, which will be coming over the Cape in a matter of some three to six, about six minutes from this time. The length of the hold, three minutes and 16 seconds. Thereafter, we will resume the countdown, aiming for a T minus zero, our ignition time of the Gemini launch vehicle of 38 minutes and 20 seconds after the hour. We have gone through a status check of the Gemini launch vehicle and the spacecraft, all major aspects just prior to coming into the hold, and they all report they are in a go condition. We will have another status check prior to resuming the countdown. When we do resume the count, the first thing that will happen is the Mod 3 guidance system will feed the flight parameters to the launch vehicle guidance system and the backup guidance, the spacecraft computer. It will feed in on the uh, launch azimuth of, correction, the flight azimuth of 97.7 degrees and the various other roll parameters that are required during the powered phase of the flight. Now, three minutes and holding, length of the hold, three minutes and 16 seconds. This is Gemini Launch Control. Uh, no word from Jack King there about the fact that they did call for a second test of these Ohm's thrusters on the spacecraft, but uh, experts here and uh, out at McDonald's say they don't see any particular significance in that. The test conductor can always call for another test, but uh, since it has not happened before, there must be some reason why he would require a second test. Maybe he just didn't get all the readings he wanted. We don't know yet. Still about a couple of minutes until the uh, hold is uh, picked up. Another minute or so to the hold is picked up and uh, the count resumes. The cloud cover has grown heavier over the Cape. Uh, it's now down to 1,600 feet uh, scattered, but there are other layers of scattered clouds so that by 14,000 feet, it's a 10 tenths cloud cover over the Cape. However, these days, they don't seem to care so much about uh, those cloud covers. They launch anyway, and uh, they say at Mission Control, this should be no restraint on the mission. Tom Stafford and Gene Cernan were not supposed to go up in this Gemini 9, you know. Uh, they were originally chosen as the backups for Elliot C. and Charles Bassett. But uh, when C. and Bassett died in the crash of their jet plane last February 28th, Stafford and Cernan were immediately made the prime crew. Dave Schumacher talked with them in Houston about the tragedy. After the fact, uh after the accident was over, uh, I know Gene and myself really didn't do a thing towards the flight for nearly 10 days. We were still very sad about the accident. We didn't even think about the flight plan or any of the training, and finally we decided, well, we've got the ball. It's time to run with it, so we've uh, been busy ever since. Gene might want to. Yeah, as, as Tom said, of course, uh, this isn't really the way, the way you want to get assigned to a flight crew. You want to get assigned and uh, be happy and... Uh, maybe have a bottle of champagne, this type of thing. This was a little bit different, but the responsibility of the flight is still there, and the requirements of what we have to accomplish in the Gemini program are still there, and I, I personally feel that that uh, now, today, that Gemini 9 is, is really going to pave the way for, for what we really have to do in the Gemini program yet to come. And uh, the accident was a tragic one, and since we worked with Elliot and Charlie, and of course, they were both our very personal friends. But I think they would just as soon we look at Gemini 9 as, as a goal, and as I said earlier, a challenge and an accomplishment, something that uh, you, can't, you can't ever look back in this program. You've got to look forward, and this is what we like to think we're doing. 
We have now in the program 45 uh, active Scott astronauts and five astronaut weather scientists weather. in training. It's now two minutes until liftoff. The countdown has been resumed. The Gemini spacecraft sitting there atop that Titan rocket. 170 tons of it out there on pad 19 of the spacecraft and the rocket together. 109 feet high it stands, almost 11 stories high. Here's Jack King. Recycle the countdown to T minus three minutes and holding. We have not received a report on this time on the difficulty. We are now at T minus three minutes and holding. We didn't get. An announcement uh, from uh, Jack King in Mission Control that the count is going back to T minus three and holding. They are holding at T minus three. Here's King again. A late moment in the countdown, a, a computer update or an update on the guidance system itself was not received. As a result, the countdown was stopped. We have returned to the three minute mark and we are holding at T minus three minutes. This is Gemini Launch Control. Now, this could be critical and could possibly mean a delay in this flight today, a uh, postponement of it for two days. If uh, the uh, uh, target vehicle was scheduled to be over the Cape, as we were led to believe, at 11.38.23, from that time on, they have just five minutes and 47 seconds to get uh, the uh, Gemini up uh, for a rendezvous by the sixth revolution. Uh, of the mission this is today. If they we're at T minus three it's minutes and holding. Uh, shortly after we resume the count, we stop the count at the one minute and 40 second mark. The reason the Mod 3 guidance system that was to update the launch vehicle and the computer did not give the proper update. We have now fed it in and resumed the countdown once again. We are now at T minus two minutes and 50 seconds and counting. That we're at T minus 50 seconds and counting, as you heard, uh, and that is well within this window. Spacecraft, it was acceptable. Now T minus two minutes, 35 seconds and counting. This was the launch azimuth information fed to both the uh, the Gemini launch vehicle guidance system and the spacecraft computer, which acts as a backup. We are now holding again at two minutes and 25 seconds. And another hold. Another hold at two We are holding at two minutes and 25 seconds. We have once again recycled the countdown to three minutes and holding. T minus three minutes and holding. We'll give a report to you on the difficulty as soon as we can check it. The maximum time of which they have, if our information previously was correct, and we've had no uh, other word from uh, mission control of this other than the, their mention of a launch, uh, optimum launch time of 11.38.23. 38 minutes and 23 seconds after 11 Eastern Standard Time. Now, they've got five minutes and 47 seconds after that uh, for this launch uh, to go today. And that means that uh, 11.42 uh, would be the last time that they could launch. Uh, that is, if this target vehicle is on that schedule of being over the Cape and in the proper position for a Nominal 11.38.23 launch. This is Gemini Launch Control, T minus three minutes and holding. Our difficulty is still with the guidance update for the launch vehicle and spacecraft. We have attempted to update the guidance system and the spacecraft computer twice. It has been rejected twice. We have received a switch over to secondary guidance in the control center when this has occurred. In other words, the information being fed for one reason or another is being rejected. We have now sent another update. We have resumed the countdown. We're at T-minus two minutes, 53 seconds, and counting. Uh, that if time, that optimum time. We once time again have a switch over on the update. We will stop the count again and shortly and recycle the T-minus three. This does not sound good at all. The we are launch. holding the count at two minutes and 40 seconds and once again recycling at the T-minus three minute mark. Same difficulty. The launch vehicle and the spacecraft are not accepting the Mod 3, the so-called Mod 3 update. This is the command, radio command guidance system feeding the update information. It's actually a computer, a ground computer, feeding update information to the launch vehicle guidance system, which is primary guidance system, and the spacecraft computer, which acts as a backup to the primary guidance system during flight. Still holding at T-minus three minutes. This that is maximum Germany time control. I mentioned a moment ago is 44.10. Uh, we have refigured it. That was my mistake a moment ago. It's 44 minutes and 10 seconds. And that is now, and that means it's three minutes and 10 seconds from now, I believe, if I can read my clock properly.